Well, I'm going to try and blast through uh, quite a bit um, uh, in the next uh, uh, half an hour. But, of course, there is a website at uh, modjustreasonfaith.org. There will be fact sheets which summarize many of the points that I'll be making tonight um, and also that uh, uh, Dr. Gordon will be making as well. And um, so uh, you can see those, and there will be video casts and things of that nature also on the modjustreasonfaith.org, so you can get a, a, a little bit more uh, detailed um, uh, approach to uh, the material for this evening. What I do want to do is, um, this is really uh, a talk about uh, what contemporary astrophysics and contemporary cosmology uh, is saying uh, about God, about creation, and, and about uh, the superintelligence of, of God. So um, uh, this book, of course, is not limited to that, uh, but Bruce Gordon and I have uh, collaborated on uh, um, uh, the first part of it, is uh, totally dedicated to it, and Bruce has written a very fine uh, uh, postscript uh, on these matters. Um, let me get uh, precisely to the point. Uh, what can science do and what can't it do? Uh, science is not like metaphysics. It is not philo uh, like philosophy. It does not uh, approach things deductively, but rather inductively from empirical facts. What does that mean? That means science, even though it can come up with reasonable and complete explanations, science uh, is always open to new discoveries. Scientific models can change. But nevertheless, even though we have to always qualify that and say scientific models can change and, and, and there can be a difference in worldview that can happen, things can be modified and adjusted, and, and in the Big Bang Theory we know that there's been uh, you know, well, 14 major modifications of the Big Bang Theory, still what happens is evidence you know, in, interfaces with other evidence and uh, soon you have a lot of mutually corroborative evidence and the mutually corroborative evidence begins to give rise to a, uh, a, a well-founded theory, and then the well-founded theory becomes a well-corroborated theory. The well-corroborated theory becomes a, a very well-corroborated theory, which is a highly probable theory, and the highly probable theory ought to be given truth, value, and credence unless you really find something which undermines that model. And so, in, in a sense, then, you do have to give respectability to um, a huge amounts of evidence that coalesce not just qualitatively, but coalesce quantitatively. That's very difficult to duplicate unless there is really rigorous truth there. But I do want to start with that qualification. Sure, something could be modified. What uh, kind of a theory is the Big Bang Theory? A very well corroborated theory. I do not think there is a serious physicist right now that uh, doubts the Big Bang Theory. They may doubt details about the Big Bang Theory, but the Big Bang model in general that the universe began 13.7 billion years ago. Um, uh, we'll talk about pre-existing periods, which are speculative. Talk about that in a moment. But the theory says the universe began with the Big Bang. And that was 13.7 billion years ago, plus or minus 200 million years. That, um, and that's actually, that's a pretty good number, uh, all things being, you know, uh, equal. Uh, it began with a, uh, an explosion. Uh, uh, the explosion did cool down uh, during a period of hyperinflation. But then again, uh, after that very brief period of hyperinflation, maybe 10 to the minus 24 seconds, the universe reheats again and continues on its way. Today it is speeding up. And the reason for that is dark energy, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But, but that's basically what the Big Bang model holds. There's not a scintilla of evidence to disprove it. Not a scintilla of evidence to disprove it. However, could there have been a pre-Big Bang period? And we're going to have to talk about that in some detail in just a moment. There might have been. But then again, there are other kinds of reasons to believe, seriously believe, that that pre-Big Bang period would itself have to have had a beginning. And if it did have a beginning, it would have had to have had an ultimate beginning. And if it had an ultimate beginning, then at one point the universe was nothing. And then it came into being. And since I think we all commonly hold that from nothing, nothing comes, you know, right, right? Nothing is really nothing, right? There's no such thing as nothing. 
Nothing's not a vacuum overlaid with laws and principles. It's not a space-time field. It's, it's really nothing. So if at one time the universe was nothing, it didn't cause itself to exist. It didn't do that because from nothing, there's only nothing. So that means there has to be something. And that something is not part of this universe. It is a transcendent cause. And I think it is reasonable to say that contemporary uh, cosmology is at the brink of seriously giving a high, highly probabilistic solution to a beginning of the universe. Let's just get into the details of it a, a, a little bit more uh, um, uh, in depth. First of all, quick explanation of the universe. Uh, we do not live in the universe of uh, Dr. Newton anymore, right? Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, the universe is not infinite in, in time and infinite in mass and has an infinite number of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, interactions of mass points which have produced everything that we know today. Uh, the universe uh, as we now know it uh, consists of about 5% of visible matter. That's the matter that emits and absorbs light. Uh, it does something, all right? This electromagnetic radiation does something. And, um, and that's, uh, that's, uh, we'll talk about how much of it there is in a moment. 23% uh, of the universe is dark matter. Dark matter does not emit and absorb light. Uh, basically, it, uh, it has gravitational effects and some other curious effects, but uh, it really doesn't do anything electromagnetically as, as we would know it. And finally, there's dark energy, which is not like dark matter at all. Dark, matter, uh, dark energy is like a field and is connected with the space-time field. And the space-time field itself, right, um, is because of the dark energy, experiences uh, uh, what's called a, a, a rapid expansion or an acceleration. And so even today, th uh, the space-time field is probably rapidly expanding. And that space-time field, which is rapidly expanding between the galaxies, is causing the universe uh, to continue to expand. And it will probably continue to expand forever. And that does put a dent in the oscillating universe theory, but we'll talk about it in just a moment. But it, it, it really does, the so-called bouncing universe theory. But we need to, to speak about it because, you know, maybe there was a previous bounce. And only in this bounce was there a preponderance of dark energy. Somehow the dark energy got greater in this bounce. But... That's always, you know, when you change the entire constituency of the universe and the bounce, you've got to be a little careful that you're not getting far-fetched scientifically. <laughs> okay. Um, so what about this visible matter? Uh, the visible matter um, probably is about uh, 10 to the 53 kilograms. Um, that's about 10 to the 80 baryons. <clears throat> that's uh, protons and neutrons. <clears throat> which, of course, is uh, the, the major mass of constituents of the universe. And uh, so it's, yeah, it's a rather finite place by comparison to what Sir Isaac Newton thought. And we're not sitting amidst an infinity, sitting amidst an infinite void. What we are doing is sitting in the midst of a very, very finite place with finite mass, finite number of baryons, finite amount of dark energy, an expanding universe that is probably, since the Big Bang anyway, 13.7 billion years old, and the time since the Big Bang might reasonably represent the age of the universe. Uh, where did we get the Big Bang model from? Very quickly, just so you get a little context. Uh, it comes from a Belgian priest, um, uh, Father Georges Lemaitre. Uh, Lemaitre, after he uh, uh, received his PhD from MIT, uh, uh, tried, there was a, a problem with radial uh, velocities of uh, what's called extragalactic nebulae, and, and, and these velocities could not be reconciled with a steady state model of Einstein's general theory of relativity. In order to solve the problem, the conundrum, uh, Georges Lemaitre posited a completely radical theory, uh, and he postulated that uh, the universe was expanding, that it had begun. Uh, as a cosmic egg, as it were, and, and uh, exploded and uh, then continued to expand. Uh, he showed his theory to Einstein. Uh, Einstein, of course, uh, looked at it and said, your mathematics is excellent. Your physics is preposterous. It's abominable. And, of course, he sent poor Lemaitre packing. Uh, but then uh, a lot of evidence began to emerge, including the red shifting from Hubble that eventually verified the theory. Uh, actually, Einstein recanted and actually told... Um, uh, Lemaitre, um, 
Uh, this is the most satisfying theory of creation I have ever had the experience of hearing. So he did change his mind. And so the, uh, it does come from a priest. Um, and uh, Lemaitre uh, still, of course, he was actually, um, you know, the Hubble constant really could be called the Lemaitre constant because uh, even though he didn't have the finely tuned elements of the quantities, uh, down uh, as, as uh, Hubble did, he certainly knew that there had to be a rate of expansion constant similar to the one that finally Hubble calculates or that uh, Hubble predicts. Uh, as we just go down the line very quickly, you can see how well corroborated the theory is. I don't want to go into the detail. Red shifts uh, from Hubble, uh, red shifting indicates an expansion uh, in, in general. Those red shifting indicates an expansion uh, in, in general. Those red shifts are, are uh, seen uh, from galaxy to galaxy and galactic system to galactic system. So in, uh, basically in the large scale universe, all you have is red shifting. And so basically what you have uh, is everything moving away from everything else. Uh, the best way of then analogizing the universe is just to think of it as a balloon uh, and just think that uh, there's some paint on that balloon and that uh, as the balloon is blowing up, all the paint molecules are moving away from all the other paint molecules. So something is not at the center, because there is no the center, but everything is at a center, as it were. And so everything is kind of uh, central to everything else on the surface of this balloon, uh, which represents the universe as a whole and continues to expand uh, in the way I, I just described. You sort of get it, I think, you know, just in, in, a, in a general sense. And uh, so uh, Penzias and Wilson uh, finally uh, um, uh, uh, put this together and, um, uh, and, and made a discovery which was very, very important of a 2.7 degree Kelvin uniformly distributed radiation. Um, this actually showed that it, it really did have to be a remnant of a very high energy emission at the beginning of the universe. It has to be that. And there's a lot of very good reasons, which I'm not going to go into, for saying this. But it so happens that the temperature of this 2.7 degrees Kelvin matches up very nicely with the Hubble redshifts. And a lot of data from the COBE satellite, the Cosmic uh, uh, um, uh, Explorer back, uh, 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 Background Satellite, and also the, uh, the MAP satellite, so basically uh, what you have is a whole grouping of evidence, different evidence bases that all come together around uh, a particular theory, the Big Bang Theory, in a quantitative way. Inflation was added to it later. Dark matter was added to it later. Energy, uh, uh, dark energy was added to it later. But still the model is essentially the same, and it is exceedingly well uh, corroborated. So uh, what, uh, what do people believe? You know, what does this uh, have to do with, uh, with uh, the universe? I, I'm just going to skip to uh, just a few things here really quickly. Um, uh, what people essentially believe is, OK, if the Big Bang is uh, the beginning of the universe, then we know what the age of the universe is. And uh, then the Big Bang uh, probably emerged out of a singularity. That is to say, the entire universe sort of uh, pushed into a single point from which point, you know, of infinite curvature of space-time, uh, the entire universe uh, uh, emerges uh, in space-time as well. So space-time, all the constants of the universe, the mass energy of the universe emerges in a single moment and uh, blows outward. Of course, there are a lot of people who would say, aha, sounds like the theory of a priest to me. Because, of course, uh, it has the, the ring of creation. And so, of course, uh, um, obviously, uh, people have tried to uh, see if there are other models uh, which uh, could, um, as it were, supplant um, the Big Bang being the beginning of the universe. And it just so happens that there is a very good reason to think that there might have been a pre-Big Bang period. Uh, and that's uh, um, uh, one of the singularity theories that was uh, originally uh, formulated by Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose. A singularity theory uh, basically means this. You have a proof of a singularity, and if you can establish that, say, five conditions, in the case of Hawking and Penrose, there were five conditions, if you can establish that these five conditions actually applied to the universe, then there would have to be a singularity. Once you get a singularity, by definition, there can be no prior physical event. 
it would be a creation event. Well, Hawking and Penrose did come up with a singularity proof, as a matter of fact, in 1968. Uh, but their third condition uh, turned out to be violated in the 1980s when Alan Guth discovered inflationary theory. And inflationary theory actually allowed uh, for the possibility to escape uh, from the third condition uh, of, of this proof. And so all of a sudden, it looked like maybe uh, there wasn't a necessity for a creation of the universe as formerly, formerly thought. Well, that, of course, uh, you know, skipping a lot of history here, uh, it did lead, at least leave the door open to a multiplicity of possible alternatives that might have existed prior uh, to the Big Bang. Uh, what are some of these alternatives? I'm just going to go through it really quickly, and I don't want to, you know, uh, belabor the point too much, but I just want to... Uh, one possibility that has been uh, offered is that there was what, what's called a, a period of quantum gravity, right? Uh, this is, would be where gravity is unified with the other three cosmic forces, the electromagnetic force, the strong nuclear force, and the weak force. And, and there, it, it's strongly interacting with these other three forces in its unity, and, and it has an entirely different physics, right? And, and so this might permit... Uh, the possibility uh, that the universe was in this quantum gravitational state for a long, long time. So prior to the Big Bang, maybe an indefinite amount of time, maybe an infinite amount of time, maybe. And then there's another theory that uh, maybe the universe was bouncing, right? It was oscillating. So, and, and now using quantum gravity, it could have even had bounces uh, within that quantum gravity state. So that's another possibility. And, and of course, there's another possibility called a multiverse, right? So uh, Andre Linde has postulated that there, there might be a, a, you know, a, a multiverse where our universe is but you know, a single little uh, you know, pond, as it were, amidst this vast ocean of expanding space. And, and uh, there might be other universes in this vast expansion of expanding fit. So uh, we're one little bubble universe amidst a sea of other bubble universes in a huge multiverse. And actually, uh, there can be some theoretical justification for this. So that's another possibility. So maybe there was this pre-Big Bang period, and maybe it was in an oscillating form, and Maybe it was in a multiverse form and so forth and so on. And so for a second there, it just seemed like, okay, uh, maybe there is really no preponderance of evidence for a beginning. And then all kinds of things began to happen. So the key thing, of course, is, okay, and what begins to happen? Um, well, several different things begin to happen. The first thing is, just think in your mind of the evidence collating in a triangle. I'm just going to talk about three kinds of evidence here that pertain to God. Two specifically pertain to a creation, and one pertains to uh, uh, what I'm going to call superintelligent design. And uh, Bruce is going to get into that in more detail momentarily. But the key thing right now is entropy. That's one point of the triangle. So somehow the law of entropy, which I'll describe in a moment, is going to foreclose some of the possibilities for an infinite or eternal universe into the past. Okay, so that's going to be one set of uh, evidence. That set of evidence, it's going to coalesce and, and corroborate another set of evidence from what's called space-time geometry. And, and, and just remember, space-time, uh, in, in, in contemporary cosmology, Space-time is a field. It is not an en empty vacuum, so, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a dynamic field, and the dynamic field is interacting with mass energy, and, and mass energy affects the space-time field. The space-time field, in turn, affects mass energy. It's a very, very different thing from merely a, a, an empty void. But space-time geometry, which is quite malleable, it can be compressed according to the density of mass energy in any particular region, or the density of mass energy in the universe itself, that can actually affect the geometry of space-time, so much so that maybe a singularity would be required. And that's why you can have proofs of a creation, proofs of a singularity from space-time. Think of the third point on your triangle as anthropic coincidences. Fine-tuning. Highly, 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 highly improbable events. Things that, you know, it's just impossible to explain by pure chance. 
And, and most physicists do not try to explain it by pure chance. Indeed, they make recourse to millions and billions and trillions of additional unobserved and unobservable universes that, as it were, kind of took the denominator of the probability function and actually decreased those values by having zillions of, of uh, you know, of universes, right? You can actually decrease the probability, uh, the improbability, like, excuse me, decrease the improbability of our universe's constants and so forth. So we're going to talk about all three very, very briefly. But these three things actually interconnect. So the law of entropy evidence connects with the space-time geometry evidence and connects with the um, anthropic coincidence evidence. And, and uh, I'm going to leave some of those anthropic coincidences uh, to Bruce. But let's get to entropy uh, just for a moment here because uh, entropy is, is really key. I'm not going to go through all arguments, but just in brief, what does entropy mean? Complex, organized, ordered systems are highly, highly, highly improbable. Chaotic, scattered, and disorganized systems are highly probable. Therefore, if you have a nice, racked group of billiard balls sitting on the billiard table, and you take a cue ball, and you hit that cue ball right into the, into the midst of all of those uh, racked billiard balls, and all the racked billiard balls suddenly scatter off in all kinds of different directions, you're not surprised. You're not surprised. All kinds of different directions, you're not surprised. You're not surprised. But on the other hand, if you took that cue ball and you hit it against one of the scattered uh, array of balls, and all of a sudden, and like a projector going backwards, it goes back into the rack, you'd think, that's unusual. <laughs> yeah. The point is, there's either, uh, an, you know, uh, there's going to be, a, you know, a propensity uh, uh, to at least stay in order, and if there's any movement uh, or work done or energy released, there's going to be a propensity for that energetic system always to lose order, always to lose organization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, to make a long story short, there are three major arguments from entropy. I'm just, I'm just going to give you two by way of example. You can get these right from the book. You can get them from the website, etc. What's the first one? The first one is really clear. There's two kinds of radiation out there in the universe. There's the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is really an undifferentiated, disorganized function. It's just not very spectacular. And it's there. It's the remnant of the Big Bang, and of course, Everything kind of gets fused into it. And then there's very highly complex light, right, with a complex spectrum. And let's just call that starlight. The majority of that kind of light is, is starlight. And what happens in a universal collapse, everyone, let's suppose we're postulating an infinite number of bounces. What happens in an infinite number of bounces, or what happens in a bounce, is basically that all the starlight from the previous uh, expansion gets folded into the cosmic microwave background radiation. It just simply becomes part of that undifferentiated spectrum. Now, if the universe then had been around for 100 bounces, why well, you'd expect that the cosmic microwave background radiation should be 100 times larger than starlight. And if it had been around for a million bounces, you'd expect that the CMB radiation would be a million times larger than starlight. And if it had been around for an infinite number of oscillations, you wouldn't have any starlight. What you'd have is CMB radiation alone. The fact is, everyone, the fact is, the CMB radiation is only 100 times larger than our uh, starlight. And that can happen from a single bounce. The upper limit would be 100 bounces. But that's the point. Doesn't look like an infinite bouncer to most physicists right now. There is another one, comes from a cosmologist named Sean Carroll, who basically, you know, there's, there's a guy by the name of Roger Penrose, very famous physicist. Roger Penrose calculated, we, we have a very low entropy universe, and that's a very good thing. 
because you want a lot of complex energy, complex organized energy in order to get complexification of life and all the kinds of highly, highly uh, integrated energetic systems. You want lots of, of, of good complex uh, energy to do that, complex systems to do all that work. Now it so happens that we do have a low entropy universe. But as you can see from the law of entropy, a low entropy universe is really against the odds. A high entropy universe where all the, the, the energy is gone, as it were, right? Uh, so that, that's really in favor, right? We, a high entropy means that uh, uh, most of your good useful energy is gone. It's, it's in a disorganized state. It's getting folded into, into a scattered and, 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 and undifferentiated array. Okay. Now, um, what uh, Roger Penrose did was he just calculated um, you know, what the odds against that uh, low entropy universe occurring were. And it turns out, and I don't have this in a nice little uh, figure, but it's 10, and then in the second exponent raised to the 10, and then, I mean, the first exponent raised to the 10, and then in the second exponent raised to the 123 to 1 against our low entropy universe. Uh, that's a big number. Let me try and explain that to you. That's like a 10, and then in the exponent you have a 1 followed by 123 zeros in the exponent. So if you write it out in ordinal notation, that number, if every zero were 10-point type, would take up a large chunk of the universe. <laughs> That's the odds against it. it. You know, honestly, the odds of a monkey tapping out Shakespeare in a single try by random tapping of the keys is more probable than the low entropy universe that we have. <laughs> Well, maybe not, but equivalently. And if you believe that, really, wow. Okay, now what's the point? Every single time you have a bounce, every single time you have a bounce, it's going to increase entropy. So you're going to have a tremendous increase in entropy. Right? Roger Penrose makes huge estimates of what that entropy increase is going to be. So just imagine going back in time. Already our universe is 10 to the 10 to the 123 to 1 against. I mean, even Roger Penrose comes out in, in, in his 1986 book. He finally says, well, you know, the creator made the special selections of, of, the, of these constants and conditions in order to have this thing occur. But let's just keep going backward in time for just a moment. And as we go backward, that means... It's going to be more fine-tuned that previous bounce and more fine-tuned the next previous bounce and more fine-tuned still. In other words, it's getting more improbable and more, like more improbable than 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 123 to 1 against. So as you're going backward in time, it doesn't seem very likely that the universe was doing a lot of bouncing because, as uh, Sean Carroll put it in uh, one of his essays, it would mean that the universe would have to be virtually infinitely fine-tuned for no apparent reason. <laughs> but maybe there was a reason. But the more bounces you postulate, the more fine-tuning, and the more you have to postulate a designer to get the fine-tuning to come up because it can't be explained by pure chance. In other words, at the end of the day, entropy really does take care of the infinite bouncing universe, and it takes care of even the new theories of infinite bouncing universe they have quantum cosmological and quantum gravitational configurations basically we have entropy still puts a gigantic death knell onto the infinite bouncing hypothesis but what about the multiverse and what about maybe an indefinite pre-big bang period there's a whole other set in our triangle space-time geometry argument Okay? And the space-time geometry arguments are rather uh, interesting as well. They're, they're very different, but they corroborate the entropy arguments. Uh, I don't want to get into it in a great deal of detail, but what I want to do is just simply say this. One can detect a boundary to space-time by either showing the re requirement for singularity, that is to say a requirement for everything in the past to converge at a single point, prior to which there couldn't have been a physical event, or you can prove it by what we're going to call the BVG theorem, which is a slightly different approach, but comes up with the same boundary to pastime. 
I just want you to recognize three big space-time geometry arguments. The first one was put together by uh, Borda and Villenkin, Arvin Borda and Alexander Villenkin in 1993. In that particular argument, which, by the way, is still valid today, there is an exception for weak energy conditions, but even Alan Guth said, you know, he's, Alan Guth said, look, the weak energy condition problem is so minimally, minimally probable that I do not consider it a problem. They basically elucidated five conditions in an inflationary model universe, which our universe is, and showed that that inflationary model universe would have to have a singularity. In 1997, they discovered a minimally, 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 minimally probable possibility of weak energy conditions being violated, but it didn't seem like it could apply to any universe even remotely resembling our own. That's still very valid today. I mean, you know, even with the, the possible exception of the weak energy conditions. The second came in 1999. Alan Guth, who is the father of inflationary theory, big MIT professor, uh, he actually uh, showed after a comprehensive study, goes through, right, assesses every single model. He comes out with this quote at the end. Hard as physicists have tried to find some kind of an inflationary model universe that does not have a beginning, still, he says, the universe uh, right now, every single cosmological model we have built based on an inflationary hypothesis has to have a beginning. He says it's so omnipresent that he considers it a virtual requirement of the inflationary model. But then the cap comes in 2003, when Borda, Villenkin, and Guth come up with what's called the BVG theorem, right? Borda, Villenkin, and Guth theorem. And that uh, theorem in uh, 2003 basically states that every inflationary model universe, all you have to have, it doesn't matter what kind of universe it is, absolutely independent of the physics of the universe, right? Independent of the physics of the universe. Any inflationary model universe, so that's, or any expanding universe. In fact, it could be expanding at just a very minimal rate. Doesn't really matter. You just have to have an average Hubble expansion greater than zero. And what they predict is that's going to have to have a beginning too. And they did it in a very simple and elegant way. Essentially, you know, if you just analogize it, as Villenkin does, to, you know, a, a spaceship passing by Earth at 100,000 miles per hour. And, of course, the, 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 the galaxies are expanding away from us at 20,000 miles per hour. And, of course, the, 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 the galaxies are expanding away from us at 20,000 miles per hour because of the expansion of space, let's say. Okay? So, remember, space is expanding between the galaxies. So, of course, this, uh, this uh, spaceship, by the time it, it gets to, let's say, another galaxy out there, what the observers see is that the universe is, uh, uh, that the spaceship is coming at them at 80,000 miles per hour, 100,000 minus 20,000. Well, if you keep that analogy, right, uh, of the expanding universe and the slowing down, right, of, of uh, relative velocities within the universe itself, as you keep going backwards, if you see what I'm saying, through time, you're going to get then relative velocities which are increasing. Right? You go to the future, decreases, you go back in time, it increases until you finally come to the speed of light in a finite proper time. And you're not going to exceed that with a relative velocity in any universe remotely resembling our own. Now what he says is that's a boundary to space-time. And that boundary to space-time, it could be a mark, on a pathway to another uh, kind of physics, or it could be an absolute beginning of the universe itself. But... And here's the curious thing. Let's suppose it's a pathway to another kind of physics. Then, of course, he says, but if that universe with its different physics, all it has to meet is one condition, and its average Hubble expansion is greater than zero, then, of course, it, too, must have a boundary to space-time. And if that demarcated another one to another uh, uh, physics, and that physics had an average Hubble expansion greater than zero, that would have to have a beginning. And eventually, you get to the point where you're actually going to have to have a beginning of all the beginnings, of all the speculated and hypothesized pre-universes, you're going to have to have one where finally uh, there is no mark of a physics, but it's just simply the beginning of the universe itself. Because the only condition that needs to be met 
is an average Hubble expansion greater than zero. People said, well, wait a minute, what about an oscillating universe or something of that nature? Even still, the BVG theorem applies because all you need is an average Hubble expansion. So just as long as the expansions and contractions average out to minimally greater than one, which they would have to if you started with an expansion, then of course, you got a problem. Every known conceivable model of the universe has to have a beginning. There have been many people who've tried to make exceptions, right? Trying to prove that the universe had, for example, uh, an average Hubble expansion equal to zero or less than zero. Every single one of those models fails for observational purposes. And by the way, some of them are just plain ludicrous. I mean, you've got things where you've got uh, you know, so much dark energy in the universe, much more than we have right now, and the superabundance of dark energy causes a big rip in space, and the big rip in space causes all the matter to fractionate, and our universe is just a single... This is all to get out of you know, the BVG theorem, but of course, B, BKL chaos disproves it, so it doesn't matter anyway. So, but the, the point is, you know, it's, it's, this is the extremes that people really have to go to in order to disprove uh, right now the BVG theorem. So what's the conclusion on these first two things? If you take entropy seriously and you take the space-time geometry argument seriously, the Board of Villenkin theorem, the uh, Alan Guth analytical uh, compendium of, of models of inflationary universes, and then the BVG theorem, the Board of Villenkin Guth theorem of 2003. If you take that, those three data points really seriously, those three evidence sets seriously, along with entropy, it is highly, highly probable that this universe began at a particular point, and it is uh, right now there. It's going to be really, really difficult to come up with a hypothetical model that will get around these three theorems and get around entropy all at the same time. It'll be very, very difficult. It'll be a very tenuous road. So I think it is a highly probable uh, conclusion. It can also always be changed, right? Science can always make a new discovery. Something can always happen. But given the conditions of a well-corroborated theory, there is a considerable amount of evidence today that would suggest that the universe had a beginning and that that beginning means a point at which the universe did not exist and came into being. And it came into being supposedly because of a cause other than the universe itself, a cause which we can call a transcendent creator. I know that I'm, uh, I need to, to move uh, you know, on, but I'm going to let Bruce Gordon talk a little bit about some of these anthropic coincidences um, in, in his talk. I just give you a sense of an anthropic coincidence. An anthropic coincidence is an example of fine tuning, high, high improbability that actually occurs in our universe and it cannot be explained by pure chance. One example of it, Bruce can fill in the details. For example, we have these constants in the universe. Constants, there, there are probably 20 of them that we know of right now. There are probably more that we don't know about. But of those 20 constants that we do know about, these numbers not only control the equations of physics, but since the equations of physics describe the laws of the universe, these numbers are actually controlling the laws of nature. They, they literally are. Now, you really want our constants to be what they are. They could, like speed of light constant, Planck's constant, weak force constant, gravitational constant, strong force constant. You really want those constants to have the values that they have. Because if they don't, we're snuffed. We're toast. <laughs> we're history. That's the simple thought. Now, let me just give you one example. This is just you know, one of myriads of examples that, that Bruce can point out. If the gravitational constant or the weak force constant, just two out of the 20, we're off by one part in 10 to the 50. One part, this is a really small fraction, you guys. That's like a point and then 49 zeros and a one, okay? That's a really small fraction. One part in 10 to the 50. Either the universe would have suffered a catastrophic collapse almost immediately, or the universe would have exploded continuously in its expansion and both of those would have ruled out life. It would have been a non-anthropic solution. So we're really, really, really lucky that we, 
You know, if you think this happened by pure chance, and most people don't, then you better find another explanation. And the other explanations are basically two, and Bruce will talk about them. One is a super intelligent designer. The other explanation is, wow, trillions of, 10 to the 10 to the 123 unobserved and unobservable universes that minimized it, causing the denominator of the probability equation to minimize the probability that uh, our universal constants actually occurred by pure chance. Well, take your pick. What's more reasonable? What's more responsible? Let Bruce fill in the details. Very interesting. <laughs> Maybe the multiple universes. <laughs>